So, hello all, we are here with uh, Alex. Uh, I'm Ludovic from uh, Unistellar. Uh, so we're here for a new live observing session or an observing session because uh, everything we are doing is uh, weather related. So Alex is from Danos Grove in, uh, in Illinois. And well, unfortunately the, the weather is uh, not with us. So Alex may show you later on his sky. But uh, in the meantime, he's going to show you uh, what he has been observing in his gallery and tell you a bit about his uh, eviscope uh, experience and especially uh, taking the eviscope into an airplane. So Alex, uh, I let you introduce yourself. Uh, well, thank you. And it's, uh, it's great to be here to, to share tonight. Uh, again, I'm, I'm Alex Bratton and a uh, uh, self-professed geek, uh, very interested in technology and allow it how, how it allows us to do new things. Um, I have been passionate about astronomy for a long time, but really know nothing about it. Uh, and it's really been just the last year and a half, and especially since I've gotten the EV scope recently, um, that I've been leaning in trying to learn more and more and just experience more and more. Um, what you see here in this picture is actually the uh, second floor balcony. It's a wooden balcony. Um, that I try to do most of my observing on to get around, uh, get above some of the trees that are in the area here. Um, and you can see at night, there can often be a lot of lights here. Uh, I'm outside of the Chicago area in uh, Bortle Class 8 skies, so it's, it's very bright here. Uh -huh. uh, I've been in darker skies with other scopes, but uh, unfortunately not had a chance to use the EV scope in a great condition. Um, but given that, I'm still blown away at how well it works in the brighter conditions. Uh, unfortunately, as Ludwig said tonight, um, I'm looking up right now, watching for openings in the clouds, and they're just coming across in such a way that we're not going to see anything live. So I'm, I'm sorry about that. Um, one of the things I wanted to share here in terms of uh, just some of the things that I've learned in using the scope, uh, you may notice hanging down at the bottom, I actually hang a, a sandbag at the bottom of the scope. Um, I use that uh, in particular just to help take a little bit of the wind vibration out. Uh, again, I'm on a wooden deck here. Um, I will either sit incredibly still next to the scope and not <laughs> let any vibrations go into the deck, or I can actually step inside the house that's disconnected from the deck and, and know that I'm not vibrating the scope. Um, I'm typically observing looking at the iPad because I love the big screen. Um, at the same time, though, looking in the eyepiece, it's, it's the same view and uh, um, definitely love the feeling I get looking through the eyepiece. It's the same thing I've had with uh, other smaller scopes that I've used. Um, I was going to share a couple of uh, images and kind of walk from a closest to us to farthest away from us uh, in terms of images tonight. Uh, one that I wanted to start with was M13 Hercules. Um, so as a, uh, as a globular cluster, um, it's only 22,000 light years away, so it's the closest one that we're going to look at tonight. Um, and what I'd like to share with you is actually a time-lapse video on a better night, um, and this is a time lapse. This was a 42 minute time lapse, but you'll notice already almost immediately I can see the cluster. Mm -hmm. So it was already looking great. And if you watch that clock in the upper left, you can see the minutes tick by. Uh, and we'll let this run for a little bit. And it just um, snapping into focus. It was just extremely impressive to watch this. Um, and this, just because how spectacular this cluster is, it's definitely one of my favorite objects in the sky to look at. Yeah, definitely. Uh, and again, I've looked through other telescopes, typically at planets. I have never looked at deep space objects before February of this year. Um, so it's, it's been just amazing to look at these things and just not be looking at them uh, on a computer screen or from the Internet. Um, and you can see, again, um, over time, I just love that the uh, EV scope was able to just, again, darken the background, sharpen the detail to it. Um, and the end result for that... Um, now, this is with just a little bit of tweaking in Lightroom. That's the, the app I use on the iPad just to clean it up. Um, but that was stunning, and that's really with knowing nothing about astrophotography. And Not that I'm trying to do astrophotography, but uh, just love the way that came out. Well, this, yeah, this one is beautiful, and uh, especially because uh, you, you spend... Uh, uh, a decent amount of time uh, observing this, uh, this image. But what's interesting too is that, you, as you explained, is that almost immediately you were able to observe the, the globular cluster. Absolutely. And that's, um, that's actually what's really surprised me is that in, in the first two minutes, um, 
nearly all of the objects that I've looked at um, just pop into detail. Yeah. Um, there's definitely a couple of really faint nebulas that I just can't see in these bright skies. Mm -hmm. um, but everything that I should be able to see, um, it just comes out exceptional. Mm -hmm. um, and again, as you saw in that video, just that it stayed on track. And it, even as it moved around, it still was able to resolve and continue layering the imagery on. Uh, just really impressive. It's a lot of fun to watch that. Indeed. Um, so another, another cluster that looks similar but a little different is uh, M5. And this is another one. And uh, just wanted to share a picture here of just what it looks like in under a minute. So again, just almost instantly being able to resolve this. Uh, and uh, this one was actually fun to watch just in live mode as opposed to trying to go into uh, more of the enhanced mode. Um, in particular, because of that concentration of stars, all of them twinkling in the atmosphere. And, of course, it's the atmosphere causing it, not the stars. But it was just a really cool effect to see the amount of shining that was coming out of a cluster like that in the live view. Mm -hmm. um, so moving on to a, another one that I uh, enjoy because of some of the contrast you can see is the Cigar Galaxy. So the Cigar Galaxy is um, a little bit farther out. So here we're at 12 million light years away. Um, and... Um, being a, a spiral galaxy, but um, on the side, you get a, just an interesting effect called a cigar because it obviously looks like a cylinder. Um, but zooming in a little bit, just the level of contrast to be able to see in that shot, again, at two minutes in. So almost immediately being able to resolve and, and see some really interesting objects that, again, I had never really seen before. So just exciting to be able to explore the, the skies and... Uh, I've had a number of sessions where, um, similar to this evening where we're doing some screen sharing, um, actually sharing my um, the Unistellar app screen mm -hmm. with the telescope views with my dad who was half a country away. Okay. And uh, just uh, going through some astronomy and looking at 10 different targets in a half an hour together, has, it's just been a great experience to learn together. And on that one, the, the level of, de of details you, you can observe is, is quite spectacular. I, I definitely like this one. And this is not touched up in Lightroom. This is, this is what it looked like coming straight out of the scope. Okay. Um, so the next one we'll go to, and this is, this is one of my favorites just because of a little of the story behind it, is uh, M51 Whirlpool. And uh, so now we're out at 37 million light years away. And in particular, here's another time-lapse video. This is a six-minute time-lapse. And we can see the spiral arms on the on the left side and the other galaxy on the right. And it's it's these two galaxies in the process of merging that I find so interesting that we're we can see the dynamic nature of the universe here. Of it's it's not static. Um, millions of years in the future, this is going to be one galaxy after they've merged. Um, but being able to see that come together um, again in the time lapse, and then taking it out to ten minutes. Um, I just love being able to get to that level of detail and see that and then look up in the sky and then look back down. And it's, it just makes it real in a way that I've never had before. And talking about Whirlpool Galaxy, uh, the, the previous live uh, we did was with uh, Alain in, uh, in Montreal. And uh, Alain told us that during one of his observation sessions, uh, he's been able to catch the supernova, which has been uh, appearing uh, in, uh, in Whirlpool Galaxy. And that's also something which is uh, absolutely stunning, you know, when you see basically a new light uh, appearing in the sky with your aviscope. Oh, it, it's, it's absolutely amazing. And, uh, and actually, that's the, uh, the next one I had on my list here was uh, M61. And in particular, the supernova. Oh, okay. So that, that, that upper right star being the supernova, and that's the kind of thing that, uh, just thinking years ago, I know it was, a, it was a spectacular event when there was a supernova that was potentially visible. Um, and it seems like we've had a handful already this year. It's just stunning to be able to think that we can do that look up, and here's a slightly cleaned up image to, to make that come out a little bit more. Um, but it, it, again, just showing the, the dynamic nature of the universe. Yes. Uh, and for this light to be coming to us from uh, over 40 million light years away, so 40 million years ago we're seeing this, um, it just gives you a very interesting feeling inside when you see the scope of the galaxy and all of these amazing things on it. And it, and it reminds us that the, the universe is a living matter and there's uh, things happening continuously there. 
Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, and uh, again, just looking up at the sky, I don't feel I ever got that feeling. Uh, being able to look through a scope like this, I get that feeling regularly now, and I really enjoy it. Um, well, that um, uh, that was kind of an initial set of things I wanted to, to run through. I've got a few more pictures to share, but uh, given that there's been some interest in how the heck do you travel with a telescope, I figured I would share some stories with that. Um, so this is me, and on my back is the EV scope in the backpack that I uh, got with it. Um, now, the some of the things that I did to try to make sure I was going to be uh, okay on aircraft. Um, so this was, I've flown four times on Southwest Airlines, so this is airline-specific, I'm expecting. Um, it uh, absolutely fit in the overhead carry-on with no problem. I made sure to, the bags you see there are actually check-in bags. Um, my other carry-on I kept very, very small so I could tuck it under the seat so nobody would complain that I was putting two bags in the overhead. Um, and I also made sure to talk to the flight attendants and gate agents about it so they understood that this was a scientific instrument and there was just no way it was going to get checked. Um, I've seen folks take violins and guitars and music instruments and other just sensitive things on aircraft and never with a problem. I wasn't expecting a problem. I just tried to think it through ahead of time. Um, and it worked very well flying from uh, Illinois back and forth to Florida, uh, as well as out to New Mexico. Uh, now, this was February and earlier before all of the, the travel problems that we're all experiencing now had really set in. Um, I don't expect that there would be any problems in the future once air travel opens up again. Um, I, personally, I'm not a big fan of the idea of taking EV scope and putting it into a rugged hard side case and checking it. Um, that's just too delicate. The same way I would never put a laptop in a hard side case and check that. Um, so I, I kept that with me the whole time. And uh, again, no problems with it. The uh, tripod itself mounted to the, it's on the far side of that backpack. Mm -hmm. um, it does stick out a little bit on the right side. So you have to be aware of just your space and just not turning into anybody because you've got something a little bigger on your back. Yeah. Um, but if you're paying attention, it wasn't a big deal. So basically, if you explain properly to the uh, airline company uh, what you that you have in into your backpack, it, it, most of the time you will be able to take it with you uh, as an uh, in cabin luggage. I, I would say for for airlines that care about their passengers, yes. yes. Um, <laughs> if if you're flying a uh, maybe I'll say a super low cost carrier that is. Um, Uh, very restrictive on what they do and don't let people do, mm. that might be more a challenge. Okay. Um, but it was just being up front, not trying to sneak it on, mm -hmm. um, talking to folks, and just the, the number of people who wanted to know more about it was really impressive. I guess so. Just talking about it getting on. I, I have a question from uh, Gigi. Uh, he was asking uh, what board to sky uh, you have of your uh, previous uh, observation you showed us. Uh, uh, those are all in uh, Bordo 8. So these are these are pretty awful skies here in uh, outside of Chicago. Okay. Um, and, and being able to see those things in Bortle 8, I've been again been very happy with. I I cannot wait. Um, I've got a location I'm hoping to travel to sometime this year in uh, in New Mexico where it's much drier skies and it's a Bortle 5, and I cannot wait to try it there. Mm. Uh, and actually, that uh, I can show some quick pictures. So this is when I actually had the scope in Florida was able to try a couple of different sites uh, in Florida. This is on a 10th floor balcony of a hotel looking out. And it worked. Even with all of those lights, it worked. Um, this the skies in the New Mexico um, when I was last there. Unfortunately, it was really cloudy, so I wasn't able to get any good observations in. But it was a much darker, darker area. Um, and then, if I'm not using it up on the, uh, the backyard deck here to get above the trees... Um, I can put it in front of the house on the sidewalk. So really sidewalk observing um, with a street light and a house light right there, and it still works just fine. So that, that again, has been very impressive to me that it, I didn't have to be in a super dark environment for that to work. Well, that, that's very important. I mean, it's obviously always better to observe in a place where you have an almost perfect contrast, but you don't have the time Definitely. to do it every night. So uh, if you just want to... Take half an hour observing, you just take the EV scope outside and that's it, you can observe. And I'm glad you said that because that, that has actually really been my, my pattern is a half hour, 45 minutes, an hour, 
Um, looking at a couple of things of interest, I've uh, actually my father and I have created a uh, our own sky catalog where we've listed out 50 or 60 targets that we want to get glimpses of, maybe take some pictures of, and and we're just walking down that in in sequence, and it's it's been a lot of fun. Uh, but being able to do it without hours of setup or hours of takedown, for me, that's been important. I unfortunately don't have a lot of free time, and the EV scope still lets me really enjoy this. Yeah. Um, and actually, this is a picture of the uh, my first light was the Orion Nebula. Um, took this in Florida, and this again was in a Bortle 8 area, and it was through light clouds. So we couldn't see most of these stars. We were actually shooting through the clouds, and I was just amazed at seeing this. Um, now, since then, uh, I've learned a whole lot more about focusing the scope and a bunch of other things to get much better pictures. But um, as far as first light, this was just great. And again, um, never really having seen uh, nebulas through a telescope before, it uh, just uh, great to just continue to explore and discover new things. Mm -hmm. um, uh, another thing that I was um, thrilled to be able to participate in earlier this year was actually observing the, uh, uh, the Atlas Comet. Um, so this is the, the visual for that. And I um, participated in Unistellar's uh, group observation of that as well. And um, to be able to point the telescope up and again, capture something that was a real time event of, something that was visible really only for a few weeks in a, a bright setting. Um, but to see it continue to move across the sky, uh, it was just awesome. Yeah. Maybe I can uh, explain a bit what we did with the, uh, the Atlas Cobb. And the, the idea was, and we asked the Unicellar community to observe at the same time the Atlas Comet. And with that, uh, we've been able to create uh, a crowdsourced image of the uh, Atlas Comet with a very, very interesting resolution. And uh, so basically we, we've been able to create an image with the observation from, I think, approximately 40 uh, EVScope users, uh, one in uh, North America, one in, one in Europe. Yeah, and it was, uh, again, great uh, not only great to participate in, but it was actually really easy to participate in. And that, that's one of the things I'm personally yes. looking forward to is the, the many different science missions that are occurring right now, looking for new planets, new interesting objects, um, uh, being able to participate in that by just being able to set up a scope and know where to go. Uh, the, I'm excited about what that future holds. Mm. Um, now, as far as experimenting with the EV scope, um, I also left it out for an almost a two-hour exposure on Bodhi's Galaxy M81. Um, and just being able to, again, get the arms of the, uh, the galaxy and capture an image, not going after astrophotography, that wasn't the goal. It was really to see what does it look like after the two hours. And the interesting thing was it looked very close to this after 10 or 15 minutes. So it doesn't take a long time to actually get really great visuals out of things. And that, that's that been great to go forward with. Oh, visually, this one is really impressive, yes. I love that one, and uh, and I really enjoy this one as well. This is the, uh, the Black Eye Galaxy, um, and this is in uh, eight minutes. And I really love, again, what strikes me the most when looking at the nebulas and the galaxies is the contrast and being able to almost feel the texture of something and, and being able to feel the three-dimensional nature of this galaxy here. Uh, just, again, really impressive. And being able to see something like that um, resolve in about eight minutes. Uh, and visually, it was visible almost immediately. Um, another one, just to be able to see the structure of a, a much larger uh, galaxy with the arms on it as far as uh, size in the sky. Uh, this is M101 Pinwheel. And again, being able to see um, all of those arms, and this is not uh, uh, not touched up in Lightroom or anything else, um, just a, a lot of fun to be able to quickly move between any of these objects as we go through. Uh -huh. Definitely. Um, another one that has just great texture to it and contrast is the Sombrero, Sombrero Galaxy, M104. And again, being able to see that edge on and uh, pick up those shadows in a relatively short period of time. Uh, and then it fleshes out, and this is, again, 29 minutes. Look very, very similar to what was visible in 5 to 10 minutes. This helps smooth it out a little bit. 
Um, another one that I think Jim is going to attempt to spend a little time on tonight, but I don't know if he's going to have any better luck with clouds than I will. Well, we're um, is figures, the, uh, yeah. yeah, the uh, the the ring nebula, and mm-hmm. uh, uh, this was an example where I hadn't really looked at it before two weeks ago, and uh, was able to just quickly in two minutes get a quick visual of it, and again, just stunning the way the color jumps out. Um, so being able to quickly go between these things and discover new new objects in the sky. Uh, and the catalog in the Unistellar app has been just really excellent for that, to be able to look at what's visible above my horizon, what's visible based on, uh, for example, to my east is my house, so I really can't look any lower than about a 30-degree elevation going east. I can very quickly see in the catalog, well, what am I going to be able to look at? Um, and then the last one here to share tonight is um, just a single star DNEB. Um, and being able to look at in a couple of minutes, pulling out really interesting star fields and just that, that great um, uh, cross effect to it as well. Um, just interesting being able to look at a bright object and pull detail like that from it. Which, which is so, sometimes complicated. I mean, if you're, if you're not an experienced uh, telescope user, just pointing at simple objects like that, uh, unless you, you, you're knowledgeable about constellations, can be a bit tricky. Uh, and that's a great point. And I, um, most of what you saw, I took with the automatic exposure settings. Um, I'm starting to explore manually setting the um, the gain and exposure times and things mm-hmm. like that. But um, I almost everything you just saw was with automatic and just letting the telescope um, take its best shot. Um, I think there's maybe a little tuning I can do in the future, but for not having to think about it, it came out pretty amazing. Definitely. So again, I've been just uh, thrilled to be able to walk around the sky, and I'm actually looking up right now, and now, unfortunately, the clouds are worse than they were before. I okay. can't even see the moon through the clouds, okay. so we're, we're not going to get a chance to look live through things tonight. Okay. But uh, I, I hope folks enjoyed the, uh, the walkthrough, just some of the uh, experiences that I've had, and uh, it, again, being able to get out as a, um, a casual astronomer and really learn and experience things. Uh, the EV Scope's been a lot of fun to do that with. Well, from the comments I'm reading, I think people really enjoyed what you what you showed us. So thank you a lot, Alex. That was uh, that was really fantastic, and uh, definitely we are going to uh, do a new, a new session at some point uh, when uh, when you have a better weather, because we are definitely curious to to see what you can observe live. That sounds great. I'm looking forward to it. Perfect. Thank you. Have a good night. Thank you. Bye, Alex.